to the Guna all those years. You read that, very cerebral, shareholder of the club, every annual general meeting, great support for the AST. Was at the David Dean meeting on the 18th of October, which we held at Resorts to London on Holloway Road. Wasn't at the Nottingham Forest game on the 23rd. Sadly passed at the age of 61. So, great loss to family, Arsenal community, Supporters Trust. So, Bernard, we're thinking of you this season of all seasons. Let's hope we do have the, the end, which would be very um, very apt given your support and your your thought about the club. So, Bernard and family, we're thinking about you. Thank you. And also, in addition to Bernard as well, we've had two other members um, sadly pass on us. The first was Paul, uh, Paul Jameson. He was uh, he was here last year at this event. Uh, he was in the sort of latter stages of cancer. Um, sorry. <clears throat> I think he spent a bit of time in hospital, and uh, as a trust, we sent him a couple of gifts. Um, he personally rang me about two days before he passed away, um, just to say thank you. Um, <clears throat> when, um, when the whole European Super League stuff happened, which we've forgotten about now, obviously, um, when the AST kind of you know, started to protest and stuff, there was a day when we did a protest. It was absolutely raining. Again, he was in the last stages of his life. He came um, with a stick, and that's how much I asked Sorry. So Paul, this is the free quiz one day. And then finally, this is going to get me even more because his son is sitting right here, so I'm not going to look. But Steve McDonald was a member of ours. He famously, on this very stage, gave Ray Parler a beer when Ray was doing a QA. I think it might have been you, Tom, actually. Ray was gagging for a beer. Steve, who was always gagging for a beer, knew he was gagging for a beer, went to get one from the bar and gave one, and he got an absolutely great applause. Steve was an absolute legend. His funeral was a few weeks ago, a few of us went. Uh, 
Thank you for Ben's his son coming, his family as well. Absolute legend. All right, peace, Steve. Don't want to forget about that, mate, because they'll be back. They'll be back. Don't worry about that. Um, look, we are. Um, we've got a raffle going on tonight, as I'm sure you know by now. Even though you may not have parted with your hard earned yet, but I'm sure you will in due course. Um, Ten pound for two tickets. Strip of five for twenty pound. Everything that we raise is going to go to um, the uh, the Arsenal Foundation. And delighted to say we've got with us tonight. Uh, just to talk a little bit about the foundation, about the community department here and the connections with Islington and the local community. Um, delighted to say we're joined by uh, the head of Arsenal in the community, Mr. Frederick Hudson. Fred, where are you? Top man. very much for, for inviting me along tonight. Um, Akil asked me to come along um, partly because very kindly you're raising money for the Arsenal Foundation tonight, but also just to give you a bit of an update on the foundation work and the work of Arsenal in the community as well. So I think where I'll start is the this football club. Um, we're, we're very proud as fans what goes on on the pitch, but we're equally proud what the club does off the pitch. Um, and we can stretch right back to the mid-1980s when the club decided, when there was no pressure to do so, to set up a community department. And it did so at the time because it wanted to give something back to this local community for the disruption that was caused on match day when the fans were coming come along. And in those days it was very different. There was often um, fights between rival fans and all sorts of many of us can remember. So, under no pressure, the club decided it wanted to, to give something back and it set up a community department. Wind forward, almost, not quite, but almost 40 years, that department now is, is 30 strong in terms of full-time staff, has a casual staff, a sessional staff of anywhere between 50 and 60, many of which are young people that have grown up in this community, that have been part of the programmes that Arsenal and Community deliver. Um, and ordinarily it might not be the obvious choices. Um, if we went out to market, there would probably be better candidates, definitely there. But it's a huge investment and a huge um, social responsibility that this club has to give back to that community in that way. The current day version of Arsenal in the community um, doesn't just deliver football programmes, far from it. That workforce that I mentioned is made up of professionals, there's teachers, there's health workers, employment officers, youth workers, and what we do, we go into, deep into this community, and we stand side by side with sections of the community that are really struggling uh, for one reason or another, and we work with local services, local partners, um, many of them statutory services from education, public health, youth offending, community safety, we stand side by side with those services and deliver some really deep and meaningful programs that helps those communities, those groups, cope a little bit better with the lives that they face. Um, but it's not just the delivery arm. You're raising money tonight for the Arsenal Foundation, which is also um, the, is the grant giving arm of the, of the football club. And uniquely, we are the only football club out of the 92 in the Premier League and the English Football League that has that set up. They all have foundations, but their foundations are separate charities, separate foundations that deliver the type of work I've mentioned. Um, but this is the only football club out of the 92 that has that delivery arm that sits within the core business of the football club and the foundation is a separate um, charity, grant making and grant giving on. So look, we should all be proud of, of that work and we all are very proud of that work. I think what we need to do is just profile that a bit more, let you know a bit more about that work so you can connect with it a bit deeper. Um, but just rest assured, it, it's doing some great work 
Islington is a great borough. It's full of wealthy people, really expensive properties, very, you know, hugely uh, high profile people living in the borough, lots of professionals, but it also, like most inner city areas, struggles with pockets of deprivation, deprivation poverty, high levels of youth crime. We, we carry a statistic that we are the borough across the country that suffers most with um, male suicide, um, and it comes the wrong end of too many na National League tables. What we've done, the learning that we've captured here over almost 40 years, we've taken through the foundation and funded with Save the Children, uh, a really unique project in the Zachary Refugee Camp in Jordan. And those safe spaces that we create here, those pitches we build, those role models, those uh, opportunities that we provide, we've lifted that approach, we've taken it into a Zachary Refugee Camp in Jordan, um, and it, it's doing similar work there. So look, as fans of this football club, we are hugely uh, proud of what goes on on the pitch, but there's just a little glimpse and a little insight into what we do off the pitch. It's not the most glamorous side of the club, but believe me, it is very, very important. And there is a never-ending queue of individuals uh, that have benefited over those almost four decades that will, uh, that will testify to that. Thank you very much. It's, um, no, it's, uh, and thanks in advance for your support for the foundation and for the work the community does via the raffle this evening, that's great. Now, um, we should probably crack on because we've got um, we've got some great guests this evening and there is, as I say, a bit of drinking and socialising and maybe even a little bit of football to be watched over the course of the evening. So, would you please join me first of all in, join, in welcoming our first two guests. I'm just, I, I tr kind of try and do the sums and uh, sums up really on my strength. But I think we're talking about looking after Arsenal players between them for well north of 40 years between you. Is that that right? Well, yeah, it got to be north of 50 years. North of 50 years. But you look so young. On a good paper room. <laughs> yeah, there we are. Hey, um, absolutely, you know, we, we like to think that um, Arsenal don't keep standards. We set them. And certainly in the world of physiotherapy and medical services, for decades now, we have set standards. And I'm delighted to say we're joined now by two of the men who individually and collectively set those standards. Um, physios, heads of medical services at Arsenal and beyond indeed. Will you please welcome Gary Lewin and Colin Lewin. Shot, but obviously, very, very big news in terms of Arsenal women. What happened last week to, um, uh, without question, our player of the year, uh, England's player of the year, uh, Golden Boot, player of the tournament, the Euros. Beth Mee has uh, ruptured her anterior cruciate ligament. And I just, I mean, I know because I've done it. Back nearest back of not being a proper footballer, having a proper footballer's injury. Um, but just, can you just tell us a little bit about what Beth's actually done, what that is, and what lies ahead in terms of rehabilitation and when, you know, how long it might take to come back? Because this is an injury that, if you go back to it, certainly 60s and 70s, people would get that, and that's your lot. Yeah, I mean, even going into the early 90s, it was a career uh, threatening injury. Um, but with medicine, or modern medicine techniques now, it's become quite a routine within professional football. Um, unfortunately, on Saturday, in the last couple of minutes, Beth um, uh, buckled her knee. <clears throat> At the time, we were very concerned about what she had done. We analysed the videos, and it, it looked quite obvious on the, on the video that she had a significant injury. So we scanned her on Monday, got confirmation that she had ruptured her cruciate. We've had one appointment with the surgeon yesterday. The knee is still very, very swollen, um, so we need to let the knee settle down and get a bit calmer. Uh, and then we'll go back to the surgeon again, uh, review the scans, review Beth, 
and I mean, she's going to have surgery in the leap, we don't know when yet. Yeah. And then, um, anterior cruciates, they can take a variable amount of time, and it depends on whether it's going to turn out to be a straightforward cruciate ligament only, or there's other um, tissues that are involved in the knee. In, from a medical point of view, we talk about six months is the healing rate for the graft, and nine months is the consolidation rate for a graft. So anything between six and nine months is the return to play. But at the moment, we're not looking that far ahead. We're just looking in, in the not too distant future of making her comfortable and getting the sweat out for the future. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, you both, Colin, you'd, you'd have taken people through that whole rehabilitation process. And, you know, if you it's a terrible injury and, you know, we're talking about surgery and whatnot. But so much of it is up here, isn't it? Just that, 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 daily, that daily grind of rehabilitation and am I going to, basically that question, am I going to be the same player when I get back? That must be the, the real challenge for Beth and for, for every footballer that injury happens to. Yeah, I think they're all worried in the early days. Uh, there's a lot of reassurance goes on, a lot of comparing other players that he's had it done and she's had it done. Look at them now. But I think we know when it happens to them at quite a young age, we know they get back often quicker, stronger, better than they were before. Because suddenly they've got this period where they're not playing. Suddenly they're being introduced to the gym or yeah, yeah. lots of other stuff where they can improve themselves in other areas of their body. So they see it as a challenge, obviously, but often if they're the right age, it's a big opportunity because we've often seen that they've got back when we do their speed tests, when they get back, do their strength tests, and we get them on the pitch, they're a bit better. So I'm trying to give them that little carrot that yeah, yeah. can often improve themselves. But yeah, with regard to your question, yeah, it is a bit of a mental battle at times because they know they've got nine months to a year stretching out in front of them. And yeah, just to add to that, Tom, obviously in women's football, the ACL rupture is, there's a higher instance of it. Yeah. Why is, and it, why is there so much? Well, there's a lot of debate on that at the moment. Um, some say it's, it's um, um, anatomical. Um, my personal belief is it's more historical and cultural because I mean, women's football has only been professional for 10 years. And there's not that infrastructure going down to the age of younger age groups. In men's football, um, they start at nine. And I mean, Colin was instrumental when in bringing a guy in called Des Ryan, who set up an athletic development program. And the, the players have come through that program. You've got seven or eight of them in the first team at the moment. Um, I've now come over and taken over on the women's side again. And um, we've linked one of Des's. Um, staff to come in and do the same thing on the women's side because the, only, the first time that the women's players are exposed to this kind of training is when they're 18 yeah and they don't see it before that so i think a lot of it's anatomical and what suddenly there's a lot more pressure on their bodies really. it's a lot more load on the body they're not strong enough um, their movements aren't great and this is what we've got to develop and one of the reasons why i've been brought back into the club is to develop this long-term vision of getting this athletic development program into the women's football I mean, on, on a positive note from Beth, if you look in the squad we've got, we've got Rafa had a cruciate, Kim Little had a cruciate, Jordan's had a cruciate. So she's got a lot of people around her that she's seen come out the other side yeah. that will work with her uh, fully. I've got to say, and put it on public record, when Jordan did her cruciate, Rob Holding was amazing. Really? Um, because he's been through it. I'm not sure, but you just after you left it. And, um, and one of the first messages Beth got when after the news came out on Saturday was from Rob Holden. So he is that kind of bloke to be fair. He is, but it's also um, from the support from a supporter's point of view. I think the message that, that doing things like this I want to get out to people is how much the club are investing and how much the club are bringing the women's game into the club as one club. Yeah. And we're sharing facilities more. You've seen the two games we've had at the Emirates already in the league. We've got all our Champions League games here. Um, I'm nagging Vinay to get more and more games here. Um, and it's, 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 it's becoming big. And I've got to put, really, put the club in the, 
they're really committed to develop the women's game in this club. Yeah, absolutely. And they're doing a lot of work with it, and that's why they're bringing idiots like me in to try and help that out. No, absolutely. And to be fair, it's following on in a tradition. I mean, Freddie was talking about when Arsenal set up the first community programme at a, a professional club in the country back in the mid the mid 80s. Of course, Vic Akers was very much involved in that, the early days of the community programme. You know, David Dean, to his credit, was a very early champion for women's football, and so Arsenal ladies were absolute standard bearers for the game before it became the game it is at the moment. Um, well, I've been friends with Vic for many years. I've, I've never forgiven him for introducing me to my wife, and we've been married 35 years. But, um, but that's a great quiz question. Who's the most successful manager of all time? Arsenal manager of all time? Yeah, Vic Akers. Vic Akers. Yeah. Got more trophies than anyone. Did half decent job at Boreham Wood as yeah, yeah. Gerard's assistant. So, but yeah, no, I mean the club are really, really looking to support and develop the women's game, and as you can see. Games we've got here. I mean, I know it's disappointing with the result and Bethany's injury Saturday, but it's coming into an atmosphere of we had over um, close to 50 for Tottenham, 40,000 on Saturday. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 really really picking up and it's really exciting and it's also a different fan base you're seeing coming into the club as well. So um, yeah, it, for me it's so positive and exciting times are ahead of us. Good, well, good you're back in the thick of it then, aren't we? Yeah, they dragged me back. <laughs> you can't, no, you can't. You can't get rid of me. I bet you didn't take much dragging, to be fair. No, that's true, yeah. <laughs> Look, obviously, Beth is going to be spending a lot of time with medical staff, a lot of time with physios. The, uh, uh, the number of players that you must have taken through rehabilitation between you, uh, you know, from serious injuries. And, uh, I've got to ask you, I'm sure there will be, like, if I asked you one player who you thought, I don't ever want him to get injured because he is absolute grief when it comes to rehabilitation. <laughs> who would that player have been, Cole? Alexis Sanchez. Is that right? Disaster. <laughs> <laughs> Just an absolute nightmare. I hated missing two minutes of training in a few weeks. I was just... Well, it's good because you want them out there. You want them desperate to get back fit, but it just made our lives hell. Did he? Yeah, just a night. Well, was it all your fault, basically? Yeah. I'm injured because yeah. of you. And listen, he was always there on time. He was always turning up. He'd work really hard. I'm not saying he was a nightmare to rehab, but his mood and his. He'd bring the whole place down. We had to get him out into the gym for one minute gone. Oh, yeah. I'm not too far away. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so wait. Yeah, it was just a, a difficult man. Um, refused to answer any of my text messages to him because he called me the police. <laughs> and so unless I ended every text message with a policeman emoji, he wouldn't reply. Is that right? Yeah. So when he got injured it was oh just a grief. Yeah. How about you, Gal? Probably the worst person to ever met a groom is right. <laughs> Absolute fruitcake. And he would smash the post to pieces. Because he hated being injured. And when he was, I mean, one of the funniest episodes we had, we used to have electrical stimulation machines, which we don't tend to use nowadays. And uh, I got him and Mike Kelly in the room together, and they would have a competition of who could turn it up the highest. <laughs> and their legs would be in complete spasm, up, up in the air. And uh, it, it, I, I say the most difficult, but the funniest. He was the funniest ever. But to look at the medical room would be a disaster when Ryan was there. Yeah. Um, but. Look, we've both been very fortunate to work with some really big names, some really good people. I, I get a bit more humble about that when I talk to fans. What I say to them is, the bottom line is, they're normal people yeah. that want to play football. And you must never forget that. And, and when you're treating them, you treat them as normal people that want to play football. And we get in a sort of a comfort zone. And, you're dealing with all these big names, but to us they're just people that want to play football. And we knees and knees. Yeah, and we want to do our best to make sure they can play football. And we get upset when they can't. We get excited when they score the winning goal in the 92nd minute uh, in a game. So we're 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 fans in a in a in a in a glorious position. Yeah, absolutely. And look, <clears throat> just to, as I say, there is a World Cup going on, bizarrely. 
I just, I thought, I don't get the women kick off in uh, 22 minutes. Yes, absolutely. I'll be following now on my phone, absolutely. so I apologise now. Um, I've never asked Ivory this, but I've, 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 I've always wanted to. You're watching the World Cup. You're watching the World Cup happen on TV. Do you watch it in a completely different way to the rest of us? Do you watch it go every time a player goes down and go, oh, he's done that? Oh, that'll be a... Do you know what I mean? Do you... Well, I'm going to be building big time now because I've done five of them sitting on the touchline, so... Yeah, um, but what about now? Yeah. On the telly? Watching it now, um... Yes, you do. I mean, we, we joke all the time because obviously we work together in the clinic now. And we all come out and... It was the same when we worked at the club, wasn't it? You get all the experts that come out. And we'll be watching the game and we think, yeah, they might have done that, they might have done that. But then you get the so-called experts that come out and say, oh, they've definitely done that. I mean, the French guy the other night that done his cruise shirt, social media went mad. And the number of diagnoses on social media, um, it, it, it's, it's crazy. And it's a bit unfair, I think, on the medical staff being on the other end of it. And it would happen with club football as well. We'd be involved with injuries and then you'll be reading the paper of these experts are telling you what the player's done. And they've got no idea what they've actually done. And it could be quite frustrating, but yeah, we watch it and have some fun in the game, don't we? It's odd when you watch the World Cup game sometimes, uh, you see the physio get stretched off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you, I'm glad you, especially, especially when you're at a player's wedding, half cut. That's true. I was at, I was at Aaron Ramsey's wedding in Wales, and it was midnight, the kickoff for that game. So we have one or two beers. Yeah, yeah, as you do. And you sit in the brains, pints of brains, I bet. It was, it's probably, yeah. It's cool, it was midnight in this hotel in Wales, wow, watching the game, and he's getting stretched off. <laughs> so my phone's going mad, I'm looking at my beer thinking, what the hell's that? <laughs> and the phone exploded, I'm sure yours did as well. But yeah, so you do watch it differently, but hopefully these physios don't get yeah. carried off. <laughs> How long between seeing him going off on a stretcher and you bursting out laughing? <laughs> how, how, how long a gap was there before you kind of process it or when the physio was going off on a stretcher? The other thing was, because of where we were sat watching it, you couldn't see what he'd done. So, all joking aside, I was hoping it wasn't something serious, you know what I mean? <laughs> he broke his leg. But, you hope it's not something cardiac. I was thinking, yeah. what, what's he done there? And I'm sure he's thrown that bad and so did your wife. Yeah, my missus thought I'd had a heart attack. She was getting the insurance papers out to check, to check what she was going to get out of it. But, I mean, the excuse I use is every time you go to a World Cup, you do a thing called an emergency action plan where you go through if a player got a serious injury. And I just thought it was about time that I should check it out personally. So there was, there was a motive behind it. Yeah, I mean, I was back in England on the Monday having surgery. I mean, the only blessing from my point of view is that the team followed me a week later, which <laughs> wasn't good for the country. It made me feel better. Absolutely. Um, this World Cup, one of the things, one of the many things it will be remembered for is the amount of injury time that's being played in games. Actually, there was one today where there was one the day, I think, the first half there was only a minute of injury time. And people were going, hey, he must have lost his watch. You know what I mean? I mean, I think the, the, the England game, there was something like 24 minutes, 25 minutes over the, the two halves of the game. Look, we still kind of call it injury time, although quite plainly it isn't. How does that, how is that going to, you know, I, I understand the whole business about supporters want to see the ball in play. And that's how it's worked out. So 60 minutes, ball in play, is the, you know, is what FIFA and the FA talked about at the start of the season, but incredibly didn't do anything really about it. But FIFA have, have obviously lent on it for this World Cup. What, what effect is that going to have on, on players? Well, I think you've got to call it the VAR time at the moment, because most of it's for sure. VAR intervention, so... Um, but we've been involved in games for donkey's years where you'll see player go down time and time and time again and the referee puts one minute injury time up and it frustrates the life out of you, especially if you're losing. Um, for example, I'm a bit older than Colin, so I now train people in first aid at uh, the FA. And uh, on average, when you put somebody on the stretcher, and we call it triple immobilisation, it should take eight minutes. 
So if anyone's going to go down with a neck injury, you can guarantee there's going to be eight minutes injury time. Right. So in my opinion, if that's what's needed to get a player off safely, then you add it on. It's the rest of it I, I, I have trouble following. And I'm watching it with great interest in that I'm not quite sure how long it's going to be before the TV companies step in. I mean, they even had to delay I'm a celebrity the other night because of the England game. Or one of the games that went on and on and on. Yeah. And I'm not quite sure how long the TV companies would, would tolerate that. So I'm all for it personally. I think it's good because I think it's all about watching a game of football. And the more you watch the game, the better it is for the supporters. Yeah. I mean, there was a joke going around by a number of um, supporters left the, the Qatar game on the opening day after about 70 minutes. They're uh, adding the injury time on to make sure people stay in the ground. But um, I'm not sure if it's working or not. What do you think, Cole? Is it, I mean, I, ju I just wonder about, it does make it all quite, I, I thought you were going to say the television companies are going to go, hang on, neck injury, we can do a, we can do a commercial break here. Do you know what I mean? There'll, there'll be an opportunity there that, that doesn't even, because we think the footballers, 45 minutes non-stop action, where it's suddenly sort of 55 minutes and there's long breaks, I expect TV companies wouldn't need a lot of pushing to go, oh, well, we'll stick a commercial or two in there. It's going to be a bit of a thing, can we go to extra time as well? If you've had, what was the England game, 114 minutes with all yeah. the time or something stupid like that, then you've got extra time, and then injury time and extra time. Well, that's why it, it's going to drag on. That's for, for us as supporters. But what does it? Is it going to put extra stress on players, or actually does stopping for a little while do them a favour? Well, I don't think that's changed much because they're stopping for a little while, whatever the time is going to be. But I think they'll be on their pitch for a bit longer in the heat. Is it going to make a difference? It'll be interesting to see the stats on the, the running distances and stuff like that. Yeah, I don't think it's a massive difference, but it's a. Uh, it's a long time. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, <clears throat> sticking with the World Cup, just wonder, uh, two things really, but they're, they're very much connected. One is, there's this, obviously there's an our club more than most, to be fair, is sending a lot of players off to the World Cup, leaving a lot behind. I just wonder what kind of, what are the challenges from a medical point of view? What are the challenges that come with those players suddenly leaving the club, different medical regime, different physios, different medical services for those guys who are off playing for their for their countries. Particularly, you kind of worry about players who've got a history of injuries. You know, Thomas Partey, for example. And even, do you worry about the ones that are left back at home, who might be kind of facing different kinds of physical challenges or whatever? I just I just wonder whether that's something that that you guys have thought about because the World Cup's happening at such a strange time? Well, it wasn't a problem for us normally because it was summertime, so the ones that were left behind were in the Caribbean, probably. Yeah, no problem. But I think uh, the ones that are going now, because they're going to lots and lots of different countries, which wasn't so much of a problem in your early days, was it? But you just try and establish a relationship with the medical teams of those countries. Looking back to the time we had players at Ivory Coast, Cameroon, Russia, France, Japan, we had to try and get a relationship with these countries. Some were fantastic, the, the French and people like that. You know, England actually, I was like, to know the physio there, so it's easy. <laughs> but some of the countries, it was quite difficult to establish a relationship. So you were pretty much sending them to the walls and just hope they came back. Yeah. The flight they said they were going to come back on, and in one piece. So that wasn't always the easiest, but in answer to your second part, leaving them behind now. I think most clubs' approach has been to give them a short break, then let's have a little mini pre-season and try to hit the ground running when it gets to toward December 18, 19, when you're a week short of the uh, Premier League restart. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. It's, when the tournament's in the summer, it, you can plan better. Um, and then when you're coming back, I mean, the biggest chance we had pre-season was working out the date that players got knocked out, what date they would come back. Then we'd work out how many players we had available in the squad, what games could we play. But you're building up for a, a target at the end of August because that's when the league will start again. The problems they've got now is the league is starting on the 26th of December and I think they've got three or four games in ten days. Yeah. You've got half your squad that are going to continue the season as planned in a, a World Cup. Yeah. 
then you've got half your squad that, that are going to have a break, reset, then train again. Now, with respect to the players that stay behind, to make up the numbers for training, they're going to join in with the younger players. And again, with respect to the younger players, the standard will drop. So are you training them as intensely as you can to get them ready so they hit the road running when we play West Ham on the 25th? And that's going to be the challenge of all the clubs in the Premier League. I know quite a few are going to the Middle East, I know Arsenal are, and so they're going to play some games out there. And then as the players get knocked out of the World Cup, they can go across and join the squad. But for me, that's going to be the biggest challenge, is the players that stay behind and, and are they going to be good to go when, when it's over? Some people have argued about them. Then you always get a tournament depression after a tournament, a major tournament, when you've been away for four or five weeks, you come back and you hit a real low. Yeah. Um, is, that, is that a physical thing? Or? No, that's a mental thing. It's a mental thing. It, it, there's been a lot of research on it now. Um, and there's something that clubs do a lot of work on when their players come back. Um, not going to have time for that this time around. No. They're not going to have a break. They're going to come straight into it. So that's going to be quite interesting on the reaction of the players when they come back. Some are going to have a great World Cup and be brilliant. Some are going to have a, a terrible World Cup. They might get injured, which would be even worse. So it's the problem is, is it's completely unprecedented. Nobody yeah. knows how it's going to go. And my gut feeling is that after we've done this one, I don't think it will happen again because I think it's been so strange for everybody. And again, what you've got to remember, when Qatar was accepted for the bid, it was a summer tournament. Yeah. So it was changed to a winter tournament after the bid had been accepted. So I'm not... You don't think people were misled about Qatar? I could be possibly common. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it changed, and that's, that's no doubt about it. It changed, and it changed the whole setup for a major tournament. Yeah. So um, it'll be interesting what the, 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 the after the aftermath of it will be and what decisions will be made upstairs. Do you, um, just finally on, on, on World Cups, Colin, I just wonder whether, did you used to send players off to major tournaments, World Cups, Euros, whatever it was, and did you have like a little kind of, did you work out an average where you know, oh, we're going to get at least two back, we won't be able to start the season? Three back. Do you know what I mean? Was, does every tournament send back a number of players, a certain proportion of players, who aren't fit to start the next season? Not necessarily for major injuries, but injuries that are going to stop them playing for a month or two months at the start of the season. Or in this case, stop them playing until February, March. There's a little bit of luck involved. I think on average, any Euros or World Cup would be sending 10. 11 of the squad away, normally to various countries, like I said. But I think, yeah, you, you expected one to come back, little 10%. Right. Little 10% thing. One will come back. How big would the injury be? Would it only be a couple of weeks hamstring, three week hamstring, and we'll keep him out a little bit of pre season? Yeah, I think if you got them all back fit well, you would count your lucky starts and glance at another club who might have three injuries and thinking, well, there's my 10%. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was unpredictable. Some years you got it really lucky, and I say lucky. There's a little bit of luck to it. Uh, some years you had three come back with significant issues, but we had a system in place where after every game, the players knew within an hour they had to text me or the doc with an update of how they were. Really? Yeah. Sometimes it got a bit abusive, as you can imagine. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, particularly if it was Alexis Sanchez, presumably. Yeah. My wife wasn't always happy on the Tuesday or the Wednesday nights. <clears throat> sitting there at midnight watching the games come in, the phone would be buzzing. And yeah. Different players updating you. So once you got the last one in that said, fit well, see you tomorrow, see you Friday, that was great. You, you knew you were going to the morning meeting the next day with Arsenal and the coaches with some good news, everyone's okay. Didn't happen very often though. <laughs> Who was, um, I mean, Gav, you had, you had Arsene and George as manager. I just wondered from. Particularly from the point of view of like getting players out of the treatment room and out on the pitch. Obviously the, the received wisdom would be George was like, well if he can walk he can play, and Arsene would be the complete is that is that really what it was like? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> right. Uh, George, question. Uh, we we under George we 
and let's put it to context, when, when I started working in 86 um, with George, there was four full-time members of staff. Four. We had George Graham, Theo Foley, Tony Dominey, the kid man, unfortunately he's no longer with us, and myself. Everyone else was part-time. Right. Um, now I'm back at the club now, on the men's side there's 27 medical staff. That's not all the staff. Um, but in those days, George had this thing about, we weren't allowed to use our training ground on a Wednesday because it was a university training ground and they had the- The one next door to the current- The one next door to where we yeah. Like, yeah. So George had this thing where um, injured players, we would treat at London Colney in the morning, so I'd be there while the team were training, and then we had to report back to Highbury at two o'clock in the afternoon every day. Because his argument was, let them come home in the rush hour a few days and their injury will suddenly get a lot better. <laughs> um, you were, we, in those days, we played Saturday to Saturday. So injured players were in on a Sunday. If they didn't return, report on the Sunday, they got a fine for a week. A week's fine. So George was very, very strict. And um, you work injured players very, very hard. Arsenal's attitude towards it is, that's my job. If I've got players that want to be in the medical room, it's my job to get rid of them. Yeah. Don't waste your time and energy on players that want to be in the medical room. And he was very, very different. Um, also, what you've got to remember is the facilities completely changed. So we bought our own training ground. We had state-of-the-art facilities. So you could spend all day treating players with justification because you had all the facilities you needed. Yeah, yeah. So the whole philosophy changed. You got more staff. Um, that's why I brought him in with me to help me out in the first place because I was allowed another member of staff, which was I was doing cartwheels when they said I'd do that. Um, so it's, it's changed dramatically and it's even changed. Don't forget, I left Arsenal in 2008 to go back full, to go full time with England. Um, and then Colin took over. And in those eight years, I mean, it, it changed dramatically. And, and Colin and, and Gaz, they, they took the, the medical department. Took completely new era um, and the setup they had was fantastic. It actually, I used to joke with him that you don't have to work for a living anymore. I used to have to work for a living. Um, but yeah, I mean, and the game now has gone to a new level again. Yeah. I just, Colin, obviously, you know, you had your your time for the most part was with, with Arsene as manager. And there, were, there were a few kind of catchphrases that sort of developed, you know, the red zone. It's like, hello? What's the red zone? You know what I mean? That's something that happens on a tube map, it's not. So, is it, there, there, were, there, there was a whole kind of, um, you know, oh, players can't be, you can't overload players, you can't do. Your fans, you're watching this team that's five points clear at the top of the table at the moment. I know we're only a third of the way into the season. But Mikel Arteta would appear to go completely against all of that. I'm going to play the same players every game. We're all going, oh, Saka needs a rest. Saka needs a rest. Arteta goes, Saka's playing. Oh, Jesus, he needs a rest. Jesus, is, you know, he will pick the same team. When, as a physio, when you look at that, do you go, yeah, fair play, he's made the judgment and they're all fine. Or do you think, actually, he's pushing his luck a little bit? How do you, how do you look at it as a, from a, from a physio, from a medical point of view? That idea of, you know, you look, you think back, 1970, 71, we played however many, 60 odd games, squad of 16. Now it's very different, but how do you, how do you look at it, that, that idea of the same team playing every week? I think the first thing to say is Arsenal is similar. I don't think it's just Mikel. Arsenal would often play the same players again and again and again. Well, he's injured now, in comes the next one. Right. That hasn't played for 15 games, so therefore <laughs> might not be at the level. So yeah, Arsenal was similar. He would play and play and play them. Um, the second thing to say is that we've got much better now at tracking what they do. The GPS units that we put on their back in training every day, we can see exactly what they've done. You can see who's cheating, you can see who's not sprinting, you can see who's down on their normals. You've got baselines for players that you expect them to do in certain sessions. So yeah, we've got much better at tracking them. And so our advice to the coaches and the manager now can be a little bit more evidence-based than it was perhaps in your early days. And to be honest, someone's opinion is often better than the data at times. Let's not try and make it as just the data. <clears throat> and 
the only thing I was going to say was, no, it's completely gone. <laughs> it, 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 yeah, the other thing you've got to remember is only we've got a lot more data and I would argue that Mikel does rotate the squad from Europa League to League. Yeah, yeah, maybe. So then you're going the same team from League game to League game to League game. But when you look at the Europa League games, they, don't, they tend to rotate early. Arsenal did it in the Carabao Cup and then when we got to the semi-final, you played the strongest team. Um, the second thing is, can't underestimate momentum yeah. and you might be playing tired players but the team momentum if you look at our last two games um, Wolves away in particular in my opinion the momentum and the confidence we were taking into the game outweighed the tiredness um, and you, you, you that is such an important part I mean I'm old enough to remember when Arsenal first come we played Blackburn at Highbury just before Christmas, we got beat 3-1 yeah. and we got booed off the pitch and everyone said, who have we brought in to be our manager? We then went, I think, 32 games unbeaten, we ended up doing the double. That's about momentum. Yeah, and we were crap against Blackburn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was a few other games we were crapping as well, but we dug in and got a result. Yeah. Um, and so it, the word momentum must come into play and you don't want to rotate players for the sake of it. But as Colin said, if there was medical evidence that they are really dangerously fatigued, yeah. then we would step in and say, this is a mistake. Right, and, and from what you've just said, Arsene, Mikel would go, okay, I'll take that on board and I'll, I'll make that decision and George would just tell you where to go. <laughs> yeah, George is funny. If you look at the, if you look at the women in the league, and I think he's 15 players. Um, one, one of the funniest stories from that, that are old enough to remember. We played, we had two games to go and we needed um, uh, three points. No, three games to go, sorry, we needed four points. We played Derby at home and got beat 2-1. We played Wimbledon at home and Nigel scored a screamer to make it 2-2 in the last minute. Well, in that game, Michael Thomas injured his knee and he did not train one minute before Anfield. Didn't he? And the day before, I took him on the pitch and did what we, everyone would call fitness test, but a fitness test is can you run, can you kill or can you tackle? And my words to George were, he will start the game but he probably won't finish. And George said, that's good enough for me, he's going to start. And it shows what I knew medically because he ends up winning us the league in the 92nd minute. So it's, it's all about opinions. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. My third point was that we are just risk it's just gamblers. We'd be advised to manage but no one's ever going to tell me, Carol, he's trained today fully, but shouldn't play tomorrow. Yeah. We just, we give them advice, we risk analysis, and give them every bit of information we've got, but listen, they're managers for a reason, they pick whatever team they want to pick. And as we say, he's injured, he's definitely not playing, then they would never go against you. Yeah. But yeah, we're just gamblers. You get better at it when you've been doing it this long. And more convincing. That's probably more, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The only thing I'd add to that, Tom, is the player plays a big part in it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were never going to tell Patrick Vieira he wasn't playing. <laughs> <laughs> if Patrick said he was playing, he's playing. <laughs> so the player has a massive part to play in that. No, absolutely. You know, you, meant, you mentioned Patrick and, you know, talking about title winning team. Just, just finally, and just really to ask you as fans, as much as, look, professionally, you've both been around hugely successful Arsenal teams. You've seen the individuals and the collective that it takes to win things as Arsenal teams. Just as fans, when you're watching this group this season so far, uh, I would imagine that, well, if there's someone in this room who says they're not exceeding expectations, then fair play. You know more about, you know, you've probably forgotten more about football than any of us will ever know, but, I think it's safe to say, exceeding all expectations, do you look at this team as fans now? You've got that professional experience. Do you look at this team and do you see things that make you think, yeah, actually, this lot have got, they've got what it needs for the long run? Well, I'm a massive fan, I always have been when you want to work here. So That's why I'm asking. Um, what I would say at the moment, and again, this isn't saying that we're going to win the league, so I'm not making headlines. 
but I compare what's going on at the moment to what happened when George Graham came in in 87, 88, when he moved on some very experienced, high profile players, and at the time he brought a lot of academy youth team players yeah, in. Yeah. But he built a spirit, he built a real belief in the players, in the club. The fans believed in the club, the fans believed in the team. And I think that came to a head in 89 when we won the league. And some of the games that season where they dug in and got results. At a wobble at the end, which was inexperienced, and I think we're going to have the same thing here. But I get that feeling now of what I felt in 89. Really? And, and I think that's probably the biggest accolade I can give the current setup in that, as a fan, I can actually share what's going on on the pitch and I can join in with it. And I yeah. think you feel that at every home game at the moment. feel part of it. I mean, it, 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 since I think halfway through last season, the, the atmosphere at this place has just been like, better than it has been for uh, as long as many of us can remember. It's been fantastic. As, how do you feel about, when you're watching Arsenal at the moment, Cole, yes, what so are you thinking about what you see? There appears to be a togetherness about the group that perhaps hasn't been there recently. And similar to what Gary said, really, the atmosphere at the place Everyone seems to be on side. There were a few sour years, can I say that? Yeah, yeah. yeah there were a few sour years where not everyone seemed to be together in the stadium for, for their own reasons. But it seems to be. I've been here four or five times since I left, but not that much. Yeah. Manly enough, I've seen four different managers do that, <laughs> including Stoivenberg when he did the Man City game. Yeah. And uh, slowly you saw it change. I came once with Emery, Jungberg, then Arteta. And you could tell there was a big togetherness. Everyone was behind them, and I think you shouldn't underestimate part of that place as well because it's, it's become a bit of a fortress, isn't it? Absolutely. So what are you saying? We're winning the league, or what? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it's not working. <laughs> it's all right. You're amongst friends, mate. No, I mean, I, I think they've given themselves a hell of a chance. Hey, eh? I think they've given themselves a hell of a chance. That's a very, very good answer. Gal, none of that bollocks. Are we going to win the league, or what? I think we're going to win the league every year, but I'm biased. <laughs>